Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O-Culture, where memory and imagination are the only devices we connect to. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. What up? Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We got a neat little episode this week. My man, Eric Arneson, is in the house. If you're on Woke Twitter, you know him as Arnamancy and from his blog of the same name. He's also part of the podcasting team at My Alchemical Bromance, one of my favorite podcasts, one of the coolest names you could find too. Eric and I are going to be chatting about the art of memory and a bit about Giordano Bruno and the imagination, or the death of it perhaps. And we're also going to get distracted a few times and go on some tangents, a bit of irony perhaps considering the subject matter. Regardless, it's a fine chat with a fine man with one of the finest mustaches you'll ever see, and we talk about that as well. So let's do this damn thing already, and cast this pot off deep into the shadows of ideas. Enjoy! Alright, so, Eric Arneson, thanks for being here, man. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. I like your show. (laughs) Oh, oh, stop, stop. But thank you so much, you know, yeah, we've talked on Twitter for, I don't know, a couple months now, just here and there. Well, one, trying to schedule this and see if we could get this going, but I have to say, man, like, of all the people that I I do interact with on Twitter, you are one of the most fascinating people that I've been able to meet on there. Part of it is because you have great names for your work. So we'll start. My work. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just they're they're so cool and catchy, and uh, we'll start with just your website. It's called mm-hmm. Arnamancy. You know, that's obviously a a riff on a lot of like divinatory names. You know, geomancy, uh-huh. pyromancy, which we should talk about. Yeah, so plus so there's my last that. name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus your last name, right? Right. Yeah, oh, yeah. Combined with your last name, and then uh, there's your podcast, My Alchemical Bromance. Which I mean, come on, that's just a great name. It's it's so fun and the spirit. Yeah, I of can't the na- I can't take ahead. credit for that name, but before we talk about your work, let's talk about you and you know where your interest in the occult and the esoteric came from i assume it goes back to being a kid like oh yeah were you you introduced to these concepts in your youth i was uh i wasn't raised in a very religious household but i had a lot of uh, curiosity about religion so i um explored a lot you know i read i read a lot about alternative religions i got really interested in stuff like wicca and neo-shamanism when I was a kid. And over time, that just turned into uh, an interest in ceremonial magic and the Western occult in general. And um, so I became a Freemason. I started studying like ceremonial magic out of uh, like Donald Michael Craig's book. I feel like my path through that was uh, fairly typical amongst people who were doing ceremonial, ceremonial magic at that time, which is like the end of the 20th century, early 2000s, that sort of stuff. Um, and I started, started continued on, except that at one point I was introduced to the uh, Art of Memory by John Michael Greer, who was my neighbor. And um, I started reading that and just devouring it and getting really into the Art of Memory, how it interacts not only with Western esotericism and magic, but also how it is sort of core to Freemasonry and and kind of a really important development potentially in in Renaissance esotericism, especially like Neoplatonism and Hermeticism and how they were reintroduced to the West. I've really been nerding out on that for a while. I speak about it a lot. And and so, yeah, I mean, you were mentioning that you had interest in the art of memory also. Like you, you came across it pretty early. Early in my interest in the esoteric, which was only just a couple of years ago, I'm, I did not grow up in a religious or spiritual household, so I was never really introduced to that side of things. I had a lot of good friends in school that would invite me to some youth group functions at, at their church, but that was more just mm-hmm. for the social aspect of it. There was uh, one girl in particular who I had a crush on where if my one friend invited me to his church, I knew she would be there. So I always said yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, <laughs> Hey, I mean, that's, a, that's a kind of spirituality. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, so the art of memory stuff, like it's connection to the occult is, is really interesting because it has so much to do at least in my point of view, from, from what I've discovered, it has a lot to do with the way our culture used to think, right? So we've changed the way that we think about the world, that we think about ourselves in relationship with the world, and just sort of the way we even like consider the world at all. I almost like to think of it this way, compared to like a Renaissance philosopher, our view of the, of, of the, of the realness of reality is completely upside down. So we have this, uh, you know, we live in a, in a world where 
materialist philosophy has sort of taken over, right? Where the real world things that are physical are considered to be like the most real and the most important. And things like the imagination or the imaginal realm or or your inner sight or whatever is considered to not only be fake, but almost like a toy. You know, it's just a toy that doesn't have any bearing on the real world. Uh, and that wasn't really always the case. In fact, it was a worldview that was really kind of like inspired by classical thinkers like Plato in particular and the, the Neoplatonic sort of view of things, maybe even more in particular since Plato's confusing and nobody ever gets them right, including me. And sort of coming across that realization or, or, or understanding what the the use of imagery was and the use of like visualization. So like when you learn ceremonial magic, especially when you go through a system like Donald Michael Craig's or um, or like the Golden Dawn system or something like that, you learn about like visualization techniques. But it's not, they don't really tell you or nothing ever really explains it satisfactorily right away how vital that is to the whole process of things working that, that essentially our ability to create images in our mind is almost akin to like a power of creation. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of a weird subject. I think it makes sense. You know, it, it goes back to, I think, the, the foundational idea that, that all ideas begin in the mind, in the imagination, and then through will and determination and intention, right, that they then come to fruition, they become a thing of some sort, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's that's exactly how it is. But maybe even in a broader sense where everything that is manifest and everything that is in existence starts out in the realm of like thought or imagination, if, even if it's the thought or imagination of the divine or the creator or the, or the prime mover or whatever you want to call it. Could we have then imagined divinity and that's where the idea comes from? That's where the concept comes from? That's where spirit comes from? It's well, just from the imagination? Uh, it's back the other way around. Okay. So the imagination precedes the thought or precedes the idea right so right. it's not that it's not that spirit exists because we imagined it it's that we can imagine spirit because it exists ah uh, okay yes so that, that is, makes sense yeah it, it is sort of backwards from how i said it but i think we're on the same page regardless but before we get more into this because i do want to talk about the history of the art of memory i want to go back to when you first were introduced to the occult uh -huh. Or spirituality in general. Something that I've sort of realized here recently as I talk to more people, and this is a question that I want to start to ask more people on the podcast. In my experience, I came to this set of beliefs in a worldview after a traumatic emotional experience. Did you come to this through something similar? Or do you see that as a commonality with people you know that they come to the occult because of something traumatic that's happened to them? Hmm... I think I That's should back up. That's a really good I, question. I know that people, for example, if you grew up in a Christian household, you probably became disenchanted because I know a lot of occultists mm -hmm. just from talking to people through the show here that, you know, they grew up Catholic or Christian and became, became disenchanted and, yeah. and sort of, it was almost like an act of rebellion where they found something else and they went with that. Right, right. I do think that traumatic experiences do drive people to look for answers. Now, I think that it's a very, very tiny percentage of people who get driven to the occult through traumatic experiences. I think a lot of them, if they're going to be driven towards something spiritual, they end up in some sort of mainstream religion. Now, people who pr who pursue the occult, I got to say, it's a, it's a pretty wide variety. Like, I think I was drawn to it from a fairly early age. Like, it was just sort of a drive. I was going to end up there. Um, and I've met other people who are like that. I think some people do it purely out of curiosity. And some people are driven to it through some sort of emotional trauma or something that they're having difficulty dealing with. And they probably then enter the occult in different areas, you know. So for me, like, the, the thaumaturgic aspect, the part of the occult that's, like, using talismans and magic to affect the real world isn't super high on my list. You know, I'm way more into the mystical side of occult stuff, probably because I wasn't driven to the occult by, you know, a need to, like, change something or deal with some kind of trauma. But but then others, I think, are uh, reached uh, or or introduced to the occult by the concept of like using magic to change the world around them, the, th the thaumaturgic side instead of the theurgic side. And hopefully, you know, you end up getting a good balance of both. I think especially in the Western tradition, in the Western mystical tradition, Western mystery tradition, whatever the heck we're supposed to call it, the thaumaturgy and the theurgy exist so closely side by side that anybody studying the occult, or especially like magic stuff, you have to you have to learn both or do both a little bit. So yeah, I mean, what what has drawn you to the occult the most so far? Like, what is it that is piquing your interest? I would say alchemy is is what really drew me in at first. It's the first subject mm -hmm. that I was 
uh, exposed to, I guess. And, and it came through, I told this story on some previous episodes, but it, it came through uh, music that mm-hmm. led me to uh, John D. And... Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I've listened to like your John Crowley episode, your first episode, mm-hmm. which was amazing. Like you got John Crowley as your first guest. That's super cool. I don't and I don't not, know how not, you did it. And it's uh-huh. funny because the music took me to John D. And then the music also took me to John Crowley's novels. If you but... have read John Crowley's novels, like he had a way of putting a lot of these concepts into into words that I don't necessarily have the artistry for. But the way he describes like uh, Giordano Bruno using his memory palace and using his mind and using images like there's that scene where where Bruno and D have the kind of little magician fa- face off where they swirl <laughs> through shape changing and all this sort of stuff yeah. uh and you never really get the con you never so the thing that that i think carly does a really good job at is sort of understanding this like view of imagination and imagery being the more important level of reality or the more real level of reality and you can see this like if you ever pick up books about image magic actually one of which is this guy right here, which John Michael Greer just put out with uh, Christopher Warnock called Astral High Magic. Uh, it's all about image magic. Um, and a lot of this image magic, it's it's always written like you're supposed to be carving these images in stone or out of gems or like all of this sort of fascinating, bizarre materials. Whereas I feel like, and in fact, I'm pretty certain that all of these things can be created imaginally. You know, the images exist in the imagination first. The phantasmic apparatus, so the ability of the mind to interface with the soul. That's where words and concepts and things that your senses pick up in the physical world are translated into images that your soul can digest and, and work with, right? So the, mm. the soul thinks in images while the, while the, the lower part of the mind uses words and, and concepts in different ways. Is that why symbols and, and archetypes are so prevalent in our society then? Because mm-hmm. whoever's putting those out there know that it speaks to us beyond our physical level, right? Yeah, because symbols are a shortcut from from soul to soul, you know, where where if you can if you can encode, if you can take an actual image from the soul and transform it into a physical image, it's a shortcut to the next person's soul, which sounds like it might be crazy. But the the place where they got this idea, the place where this idea started to develop is really interesting. It's from Plato. In well, one of his uh, dialogues, which I think is Meno. Uh, I want to look at this. Yes, Meno. Meno discusses the concept of anamnesis. Anamnesis is the soul's remembering. So Socrates taught that the soul undergoes metempsychosis, which means that when you die, when your body dies, your soul returns to the original source and then descends back into the material world again through a process of you know manifestation into the material world. That transferal into the material world is so traumatic that your soul loses touch with the monad, with the original source. And slowly over time, the process of philosophy is the process of sort of like understanding more about yourself, understanding more about the world, understanding more about creation so that your soul connects more and more with, with the source. Anamnesis is, uh, is the way that Socrates believes that knowledge works, that learning works. When you learn something new, you're not creating new knowledge. You know, like, for instance, when you learn that five plus eight is 13, you didn't just create that. It's not like all of a sudden you have a new fact that didn't exist before. Instead, your soul has regained some knowledge that it possessed before it incarnated into your traumatic material form. So part of this concept I don't really like very much because it's very dualist and it sort of draws this line between like the material and the spiritual mm-hmm. world. And I think that's a dangerous line to, to make. Time out. Okay. So this is something that I've, I've read more about recently is that dualism is sort of a, uh, a dangerous path to walk. Do you agree with that? I don't know. I have no, I'm not, I'm not sure yet, I guess is the way to put that. I think, um, so a really good example of like the, the conflict between uh, monism and dualism, like the concept that uh, all is one, you know, that the, that the physical manifestation is, is a smooth transition from spirit or soul or creation or whatever, like all of it is the same thing. And then, you know, dualism being the concept of like the material world almost being like the the cruft, the, the the crust of the bread or the or the crumbs that fell out of the loaf or whatever that your soul is sort of dripping down into. If you look in the Corpus Hermeticum, it's a collection of what, like 16, 17 different books. Some of them have a really dualistic point of view and some of them have a monistic point of view. So there's not a lot of internal agreement on that. And 
I think I can't remember who it was. It might have been Brian Kopenhauer who wrote that he thinks it's a an initiatory difference, right? Like once you get to second le- once you become a second level hermeticist, you learn how to cast fireball, and then you also get that was a D and D joke. You didn't laugh at a D and D joke. I'm sorry. I'm just listening <laughs> to you, man. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm sure everybody in the audience laughed. Thank you. Well, wait, you, wait, audience. wait, wait. Can I confess? I've never played D and D. Well, I mean, really. Okay, and that's cool. Uh, really? That's yeah. cool? No, it's not cool be- because I – okay, this goes back to my story that I started – and not to keep going on tangents here, but I didn't grow up in a religious slash spiritual house. I did not grow mm-hmm. up doing or playing or exposing myself to the more fantastical side of pop culture. Like the most out there I got was I just – I really like comic books. I had a very traditional sort of brainwashed American childhood where I I was into sports. I played a bunch of sports. I watched a bunch of sports and I did develop, you know, like a a hunger for knowledge, I guess. I've always liked to read. Mm -hmm. So I was always reading something. But in terms of like, you know, like fantasy fiction, for example, you know, going back to like John Crowley or D&D, I guess, I never got into that stuff when I was young. It was only like, college or post-college that i sort of discovered this world like i'd never read yeah lord of, i'd never read lord of the rings until the movies came out you know oh wow yeah so it's like i just never was exposed to that and i never took an interest in it uh-huh. now i i see like everything that i missed as you know like i didn't grow up in the <laughs> 80s when D was like really popular that's something that now like if you said hey i have a group of guys we're gonna go play D i i'd be like okay i've never played it but i'm i'm down because i know what it is now and, and i know what you have uh-huh. to do that's a game where it's 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 all imagination right yeah yeah absolutely and actually um you know I, uh, that's a, another path i think a lot of uh uh, occultists uh, who got around who got into it at the same time I did played D&D when they were kids they were like this is awesome yeah. so they already had practice using so I mean yeah uh, okay hold on hold on let me finish up the monism versus dualism right, right, thing yeah. in the corpus Sorry. hermeticum so the concept was that like after this initiation it was it was uh you know you'd you'd be like initiated originally like in the bottom level and learn the dualist way of things and then they'd be like aha it's not dualism after all it's monism uh, or maybe it was the other way around. All I know is that both are really attractive systems. Both help explain a lot of stuff. It could be that both are true or that neither is true. I don't know that dualism is necessarily a dangerous one, but it does lend to things like believing that the physical world is evil or that um, you can neglect the physical world. And that's dangerous for sure. Neglecting the physical world is bad. You should totally like clean the litter box, you know, shower every once in a while go to work, you know, taking care of all the mundanities of life is, is part of the soul evolving process, unfortunately. Oh, I was with you until you said go to work, because that does not appeal to me in the slightest anymore. (laughs) Uh, Same here. I hate going to work. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, one of my teachers once said to me, the last thing the world needs is another unemployed magician. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose that is true. Yeah. Uh, well, so. that's a that's a good that's a good question in here maybe about have you ever used magic to make your job easier on you? Yes, yes. Actually, um, there's even a whole school of this now of like financial sorcery. Um, a guy named Jason Miller, I think, wrote a book on this. Uh, let me see if I can see it from here. Yeah, it was him. Yeah, yeah, Jason Miller. I was really interested in seeing this. Like, I had done. Um, I've done magic in the past that was financially motivated, whether to like, you know, pay rent, help with freelancing, that sort of stuff. I don't do it very often. It's I, I it's hard for me to get motivated to use magic for real world effects because a lot of times I'm sort of like, you know, I could do this myself. I don't need magic to do it. But it works. Or when it works, it's cool. But yeah, there's this whole there's this whole school of it now. Like if you get Jason Miller's book, it's got like tons of different rituals for you know, Jupiter magic and money boxes and it's, yeah, who knows? I don't know. Magicians are weird. Yeah. Financial sorcery is something that, and this goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of, you know, thinking the, the physical world is, is evil, but man, I don't value money anymore. And I don't know if Mm -hmm. that's a good thing or a bad thing. I've come to learn that in my life, I've always had enough. I've always had what Mm -hmm. I needed. I've never had excess because I I don't think I need it. I, I don't need excess wealth to be happy. But 
there are times where I'm like, man, I could really use, uh, I could really upgrade my recording software, but it's like thousand dollars to get like a a, a full fledged mm-hmm. program that I just I don't have the cash to put into that right now, you know. Yeah. So I'm thinking right. like, well, I know that feeling. Maybe if I valued money more, there more would come to me, and I'd be able to put more into something like that. You know, as as long as I don't spend it on, I think like frivolous, unnecessary bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like I used to spend all my money on fucking DVDs because I thought when I was in college <laughs> that I I needed all these movies. You know, and now I'm just yeah. like, I, I haven't bought a DVD in probably five years. So oh man, I remember. Yeah, actually, you know, that's uh, that's actually one of the changes that that I went through at some point was. Uh, realizing so i was i'm a software developer so there is a period of time where i was making plenty of money and one day i realized that it wasn't you know i didn't need it like i wasn't having very much fun with it my excess money the excess wealth that i had wasn't being spent in any intelligent way or saved in any intelligent (laughs) way it was just being used to i mean i was making bad decisions with it i was just like partying all the time or wasting it on stuff and i got more you know and you accumulate more and more junk that's the other thing. Exactly. So uh, at some point, I just got rid of everything. I was like, I'm getting rid of everything except for 30 boxes of books. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so... still a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess you, I, I have a I have a pretty nice library. I, I get you can only see a little bit of it here, but mm-hmm. there's like another. Yeah. So 30 boxes of books, which it, that that collection has grown, but um, everything else I just kind of got rid of, and then I got rid of. Having that sort of career, too. So I don't have like a steady career in computer science. And instead, I'm just a freelancer, which means, yeah, it's the same thing. You like you, you get as much money as you value, pretty mm-hmm. much. Because yeah. you choose your own hours and you choose how much you're going to work and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, that's something that I, <laughs> I would love to, to transition to. But then again, I, I just, mm-hmm. there's some part of me that just does not have the desire to work for anyone anymore. Yeah. I, like freelance would be cool because I'd have more time and I could manage my own time better. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like ah, I'm still taking orders from somebody, you know, I'm, I'm still at their mercy. And I just, maybe that's like part of my personality that I need to alchemically transmute, but I just don't mm-hmm. really, I've never really being told what to do. Even if it's like a freelance gig that I'm voluntarily doing, like it's still, it still does not uh-huh. appeal to me. So I, I don't know. How I to deal with that. understand that feeling totally. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Well then I guess you're going to need to, uh, win the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you get, is there a job out there where I can live in a, a cabin in the woods and just read books all day and have conversations with people like you? Uh, you mean like, a monk with Skype. Yes, that's. I think. Yeah, I, think I think that's think what we're getting. They call at. it. Yeah. They call it being a monk. Yeah. Yeah. You have to spend. I think part of the day gardening, and then you get to uh, also. Yeah. <laughs> read books and talk to people on Skype. Definitely. Um, so let's let's get back into the art of memory. And I'm sorry for taking okay, us down okay. these these weird. Yeah. No problem. Here. How about his, some history stuff? Yeah. Let's go back to the history of. Did we really define what it was? Like, like just the basic concept? <laughs> no, nope, nope, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, here's a description of the art of memory that we're going to be talking about. It's, uh, it's otherwise known as the method of loci or a memory palace. It is heavily dependent, entirely dependent on your ability to use your imagination and form images in your mind. It takes a little bit of practice to get set up and going. The base concept is you memorize some sort of space. It's usually like an architectural structure, like a church or your apartment or a castle or uh, a walk down the street or something like that, where in this, and you and you walk through this uh, this space, the, the building or the street or whatever, in the same order over and over and over in your mind until you have a very clear picture of of the whole thing. And while you're walking through this, you divide it into spaces, locations, uh, Loki. Each one uh, has to be about large enough to hold a, an adult person. And you want them to be varied and well lit. Uh, in some systems, they don't have to be super varied, but you, you also add some sort of marker in your imagination. So like, you know, every fifth driveway, there's a gold tree or something like that, you know, so you have differentiation. Then to use this structure... For memorizing things, you take the list of things that you're going to memorize or the sequence of things you're going to memorize. And for each element, you create an image, uh, some sort of vivid image that sticks out really well in your head. Uh, a lot of times you'll use visual puns. 
Um, sometimes you'll have uh, systems for creating the images as well, depending on how complicated the memory system is. And uh, you place them in order in your in your Loki, in your, your memory walk. And then to recall, you in your mind, you walk down the, you walk through your, your memory structure, and at each locus, you see the image, and the thing that that image is to remind you of springs to mind. So that's the basic system of the art of memory. One of the reasons it works is because, for some reason, our memories, our visual memories works work really well with space. Like, we're, we're pre-wired to associate space with memory. Probably some ancient adaptation for, you know, not getting lost in the woods or, you know, running away from lions or whatever. So you could, you know, make right. choices quickly. I don't know. Who knows? That was a long time ago. I wasn't alive then. So for the, the history, there's this really interesting book that came out recently called The Memory Code by what is her name? Lynn Kelly. And it's about memory attached to Neolithic structures. And it's super fascinating. Basically, well, it's not just Neolithic structures. It's how uh, non-literate and pre-literate societies use memory to store information, either through like oral traditions. Um, she uses like the the dream walking or the, the, the song paths of Aboriginal uh, Australians. She talks to non-literate uh, societies, I think, in Africa and in southwestern United States about how they encoded information and how they pass information on. And it turns out that we have used space for memory since probably since we were able to communicate images or even use our imagination. And she experiments with it. So in her book, she talks about using the art of memory in this sort of way that is physically walking places, physically using objects to encode memories on them in her imagination. So it could be that the art of memory that we use today is so far pre-writing that we will never know its origin. It might go, it might go back to our, you know, first need to communicate or first need to store information. But our legend ties it to this dude named uh, Simonides of, of Chaos, who was one of the nine Greek lyrical poets who divined it, or who discovered the art of memory or the, the art of loci after a disastrous dinner where every guest was killed except for him. And the, it was a it was a collapsing building, and it was such a mess that the only and he discovered that if he pictured the table and the seats around the table, he could remember who was sitting what by by walking it in order. And he's like, ah, oh, the art of memory. I'm a genius. Uh, I'm just going to go escape death a bunch. <laughs> So, but then it it developed, right? Like, you know, when we were talking about, you know, thought and imagination, you such a more like profound and sacred nature in, in society that, that our ability to hold images in our mind and to create memories that we then recall, like you can, so memory is, 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 is amazing because you can actually create memories that you can then recall later. Like you can make whole new images in your head that never exist in the real world that stay in your memory just as much as your real images, right? Yeah. So, you know, you can you can take like your microphone for instance and create in your head a version that is uh bright pink and has bat wings. And you can watch it fluttering around your room and when you're editing this episode later, you'll have the exact same image. You'll be like, "Oh yeah, I remember seeing that fluttering around my room, bouncing into that one wall or doing this one specific thing." The image is just as legitimate and real as any other memory you could create. Why is that? That's weird. Is there an explanation for that? <laughs> I mean, I'm well, uh, yeah, because our um, our memory is magical. Oh, pretty simple then. Yeah, there we go. I, I mean, who knows if that's the answer? But that's what that's what it, that's how it was interpreted. And then it, over time, you know, it just became so embroiled in you know the art of memory became became so embroiled in all sorts of classical systems. So in uh, I think it was Cicero who assigned memory to be a part of prudence, which is one of the four classical uh, virtues. The what are they called? Platonic virtues, I believe. They're the four platonic virtues. So Cicero decided that memory was part of prudence along with intelligence and foresight, and that memory is related to invention. And then later on, like Augustine creates this image of memory where memory is the only way by which you're able to relate to God. Like without memory, the reason memory is so sacred is that with it, you remember God. Augustine was a beautiful writer and maybe a little nuts. <laughs> hey, so when writing was invented, and, and that, I think, 
goes back to Thoth, maybe. Uh, I don't know if that's actually yeah, proven, yeah. but Thoth is usually considered the guy who invented writing, or the guy, I don't know if he mm-hmm. even was a guy, but the, the entity that invented writing. Uh-huh. So when that happened, when we did invent writing, how did that change the way that we used memory? No, oddly enough, that's something that I like. That that's a really important thing to bring up. It every time we develop a way of recording information outside of our brains, we use our brains less for recording information. So uh, Socrates also relates this story of Thoth presenting writing to Ammon, who is the king of the gods, the Egyptian gods. So he tells Ammon, he's like, "Hey, I invented this thing called writing. It's super cool. We can write down our thoughts, and somebody who's never even heard us speak can look at this and say and know exactly what we said." And Ammon is like, "Thoth, you idiot." Well, he, did, he probably did call it an idiot. But he's like, Thoth, that's cool, and it's got a lot of power, and, and that's interesting. But I'm afraid that if people start writing stuff down, they will use their memory less often. Now, ironically, while writing may have started the process, writing was expensive and difficult. You know, paper didn't get really invented until later, so writing itself wasn't easy. Things like, you know, books were, books, even even the... Greeks, you know, made books out of like parchment and vellum and stuff. So like dead animals. You had papyrus in Egypt, but that could only be made in specific places and wasn't very, and was fairly fragile. So writing took a little while to really cause the damage that, you know, it really to get to its full potential of uh, damage to, to memory. It took a long time. It was the printing press that really did it. The printing press killed the art of memory. And in fact, really, really quickly, if you read Francis Yates books on it and Mary Carruthers books on it, you'll see that like the art of memory... When it when when the printing press was introduced to Europe, uh, it exploded in popularity, like a scale that is difficult to even imagine. So in thirteen in the fourteen thirties, uh, he has his first press, starts printing the Bible. By fifteen hundred, that's that's in like less than seventy years. Uh, we printed twenty million books, and then by sixteen hundred, we had printed about two hundred million books. Like printing press was nuts popular, like bigger than um, the Beatles. Wow. So does Maybe. that mean, okay, but now I've read some people's commentary on this same thing in terms of the printing press. They also mm-hmm. attribute that to being a positive thing because of the yeah. ability to circulate knowledge through books. Oh, yeah. Just for example, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because you're more knowledgeable here, but previously, like only the, the priest class could read the Bible, for example. Yeah, exactly. Totally. So, yeah, and I mean... One should be careful to say that any any occurrence in history was entirely bad or entirely good, right? I mean, the, the invention of the printing press, uh, I obviously am super in favor of it. I have a ginormous number yeah. of books. I love to read. I'm a huge reader. And um, and almost all of my knowledge, you know, I'm, I'm totally book taught. So, yeah, I think the printing press was awesome. Um, but like I said, you know, humans, uh, as a rule, when we can be lazy, we will be lazy. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been introduced to, like, um, microwave pizza. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've had a few <laughs> microwave pizzas in my day. But, I mean, I'm... that's that's perfect, right? It's a robot that makes a pizza for you that is frozen, and it just hangs out until you make it, another robot heat it up for you, and then you've got a friggin' pizza. You don't have to make it yourself. No. In fact, so few humans touched that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah the the way that i eat them i barely touch them it's usually just like one one giant <laughs> shovel like right and, into my mouth right and <laughs> an inhalation yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> so so basically you know what robots and microwaves did for pizza uh the printing press did to the art of memory right right we get our we get our 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 knowledge handed to us printed out we also, and this is a really fascinating subject, which I think I might have already rambled about a little bit, but like the death of imagination in our culture is also tied to the direction of the printing press. I, I, I totally, I really don't want to blame the printing press on the death of imagination. I think that we should really blame Protestants, <laughs> but, <laughs> and maybe, and maybe like, yeah, let's totally blame the Protestants. Um, Juan, Juan Culliano has this awesome book called Eros and Magic in the Renaissance that talks about this, but it's basically uh, Protestantism did a lot of great things in like throwing off the yoke of oppressive, you know, thought policing by the Catholic Church and stuff, uh, while well introducing its own form of thought policing. But at the same time, like it got rid of this whole language of imagery, you know, claiming that like imagination and imagery, uh, iconography, all of this was idolatry, you know, by by having like paintings of Jesus or by having like cults of saints you were practicing idolatry and not worshiping god like you're supposed to so they just chucked it all 
and we law and and the imagination was really downplayed like uh holding images in your imagination at all was considered to be a form of idolatry in a lot of cases and this was strange you can see hints of this in luther's work as as his career goes on uh oh by the way it's the 500th anniversary sometime this year was the 500th anniversary of the 95 theses yeah, yeah. 500 years of protestantism i read uh i read a blog <laughs> article somewhere about that from somebody a couple months ago maybe so yeah pretty exciting <laughs> if you're into that sort of thing right yeah but that that but that led directly to you know the way that uh, we're sort of taught to be imagination today that's like a children's toy uh, and even imagination like a lot of scholars who write about this stuff use terms like imaginal yeah. instead of imagination and we don't use the word phantasmal in the same way anymore like now it's like a ghost where it used yeah. to be this important faculty that we had to create and 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 communicate images to each other great horror movie too oh yeah the uh tall man right yeah that was that was filmed in oregon i think was it really okay i don't know i feel like it was <laughs> i'm All sure right. uh your listeners will look it up on wikipedia and will tweet at yes. me that i'm wrong See, we're not so, going to look it up, even though we could, because we're trying to test oh, our yeah. memory here. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't remember, which is fine, which is fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. Back to phantasm, though. Yeah, that is a, a mm-hmm. word that I, I've heard you use when talking about this before in some of your lectures mm-hmm. here. And it is a word that I, I think, like like you said, it's sort of a forgotten word in terms of what it actually means. And mm-hmm. I think that goes back to, who was it? Was it Camilo? that said something uh, about it camillo because he All had right. the camillo had the memory theater i don't remember right. if he used it where the word phantasm came from i'm not saying that he invented it or something i'm just saying uh-huh. like i'm trying to remember like you described it as similar to plato's forms like creating phantasms mm-hmm. were similar to plato's forms could you explain that concept yeah, so Plato's forms pre-exist. They are the kind of like the template out of which reality, the reality that we, that the visual reality or the sensory reality that we interact with with our bodies and senses. This is all, these are all shadows or or impressions or various condensations even of Plato's forms. Uh, Plato's forms pre-exist them. Our imagination is like moving closer to the forms, so there's a potential that if you use your imagination in the right way, you can perceive the forms themselves, which is probably sort of like akin to like enlightenment or some sort of illuminating experience, you know, gazing on the face of God or something like that. So, yeah, the, and the phantasm, like the, I, I think I used before the, the term phantasmal apparatus, which is the, the link or the connection between your physical, your physical body you know, you, the shadow of the ideal you and your soul, which is a higher form of you and connected in some sense through, you know, the trickle of trauma to the divine source. That was a long and weird sentence well, and I totally lost it there at the end. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so is it Giulio Camillo said that um, the theater of memory is meant to mm-hmm. be a catalog of, of all knowledge and yeah. by holding everything in the mind, you could create the ultimate combination of phantasms. So, what, yes. what is he saying there exactly? Okay, this is um, this is this is tied to that concept of anamnesis. It's it's also tied to the uh, the alchemical concept, you know, as above, so below, that comes from the the Emerald Tablet and is sort of considered like the Hermetic axiom that the lower world or that that the world that we exist in, our material world, is a reflection of the immaterial world or the world of creation, the world of forms. So. Uh, Camillo believed that all knowledge was catalogable, that we could catalog all available human knowledge. And by doing so, you could create a perfect image of the microverse of the physical world in your mind, thus connecting you like ultimately with the with the monad, with the source. You would have, since you had a catalog of everything, the image or the phantasm, the, co- the collection of phantasms in your mind would be a perfect reflection of the projector of phantasms above. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what you were asking. So this goes back to what we were talking about too, I think with, with the Protestants, you know, that Uh creating phantasms in their view is the same as worshiping an idol. Right. So they would see essentially to basically boil that down. They would see imagination as, as sin. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Why? Think about, well, (laughs) uh, there's a passage in the Bible about sin that says even by imagining it, 
it, once sin has occurred in your thoughts, sin has already occurred, right? You sin the minute you think you think you know, about sinning. Taking a step further, an image that might be an image of a saint is worshiping a saint, idolatry, before the before you even have a physical image of it. So if I imagine something positive and good that's not idolatrous, it, it's still sinful? Depends how good it is. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I'm. I guess I'm just trying to figure out if, if they see using your imagination in general as a sinful act, then I can't imagine anything, no matter what it is. Yeah, you know that's. Uh, I have a difficult time understanding it as well. It's one of those things. I I go back and reread Culiano pretty often to try to, to try to comprehend this because it's a totally different. It's basically an assault on a worldview that is that is completely alien to us. You know the the Renaissance man, the Renaissance mind, did not look at the world the same way we do. John Crowley, in his book, he really, really tries to get that across. I think he had a really keen understanding of, of Culliano's message. And and I think he does a really good job of getting... I, I wish that I had as good a way of explaining it as he does of showing it. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Let's stay on that point for just a moment. Okay. You, you said that memory and imagination and fantasy have changed since the time of the Renaissance. What was the major difference between how Renaissance thinkers viewed these concepts and how we see them now? Like, why has it changed so much, I guess? I guess uh, they didn't have as much of a line between the material and the spiritual, right? Like, we draw a pretty hard line. Um, in their world, a, something that exists spiritually, whether it's a, an image or a phantasm, pre-exists things that, it, that exist in the material world. So the material world comes forth from that phantasmal. We don't look at things that way. It's it's hard for, you know, we're, we're basically taught exactly the opposite. We live in a world where materialism has really taken over. So to us, it's us creating the phantasmal, right? So when you imagine, those are images that you created in your head instead of those images manifesting through you. Right. It's, it's, up, it's backwards, upside down, I guess, is how I would put it. Is that similar to concepts like the tulpa or the thought form? Yes, absolutely. Those came out of that, or the, those are definitely uh, related to that. Uh, tulpas and thought forms, you know, tulpas are a type of thought form. Images are thought forms. Not always. Oh, a great example. The golem. Oh, yeah. You know about the golem? The So the golem is written about in the Sefer Yetzirah, which is a very old book that was later adapted by Kabbalists. And it is uh, an image that that is also material. So that great act of magic is supposedly like the ability to create an image so intense or so pure that it also becomes real, which is very similar to, I think, how a tulpa is usually described, like an image that gains a material reality of some sort, or at least some sort of material shadow. When Arya Coplin writes about the golem's magic in the in his translation of the Sefer Yetzirah, he talks about uh, these rabbi who were able to create food and sustain themselves based on their imagination they're able to imagine food that was so real that they could eat it basically hmm. which that's got to be a cool superpower i would think so yeah i mean i would yeah, have I mean, probably going back to your microwave pizza i was gonna say i would have many more <laughs> microwave pizzas in my freezer right now <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should talk about what kind of beer you're drinking because i know that you like to do that on your <laughs> podcast so Give our listeners a taste of what my alchemical bromance is all about. All right. I'm 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 excited that you asked because uh, this is a really cool beer. This is Bad Santa from Pelican Brewing. Um, Pelican Brewing is uh, a great brewery on the Oregon coast. It is a Cascadian dark ale, a CDA, Ooh. which is kind of a combination porter IPA style. So it's a darker beer, usually with roasty notes and roasty flavors. It's still fairly hoppy. And I'm going to drink it out of a skull. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. For people that can't see us, it's not an actual skull skull. It's, 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 a, it's a skull glass. <laughs> yeah, it's a tiny glass skull. Wait a minute. I'm going to cut that out because I want people to imagine you drinking beer out of a like a human skull. That, I think, would be a Me better too. image for them. <laughs> I think that would be way better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. So, And we should also maybe talk about your mustache because you My have... Mustache. You have the the twirled mustache yeah. going on. Do you use like some sort of uh, cream or well, I'm not sure what, what you do to, to twirl that I up there. I use uh, mustache wax. I use yes, two different wax. varieties. Not, uh, yeah. Oregon wild hair, which is a 
a relatively soft mustache wax made in Oregon. And then Firehouse, I think, is the other one. And I think it's made in Tennessee. Yeah, mustache wax. It's uh, I've been doing it for a long time. It's not an uncommon look in Portland. I've not <laughs> been to Portland for many years. I, I went there uh-huh. when I was probably, let's see, so I'm 33 now. I was probably there when I was like 23 or 22, so probably like 10 years ago. And this was pre-hipster. Yeah. Well, pre-term hipster, I guess, as as a yeah, yeah. pop culture description of whatever, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know like it's all... Wear, wear flannel. Yeah, I, I mean, I know it's a whole lifestyle beyond that, but, but pre-hipster, and I still was seeing guys back then... Mm-hmm. walking around like that and it blew my mind because i you know i'd only seen that in like old movies <laughs> and, and you know he, yeah. here are guys like living with twirled mustaches and fucking top hats not kidding i saw a guy with a top hat in portland well, there's a dude ago. in my neighborhood who walks around with a top hat okay um go. and i'm a i'm a freemason so you know mm-hmm. um the head of masonic lodge wears a top hat but only during meetings oh really i, I didn't know so, that no, not like okay. out on the street Oh. oh, yeah. it's Unless you're in Texas. In Texas, they usually wear a cowboy hat, but okay. in most other places, they wear a top hat. Wow. Is there a specific, and you don't have to spoil anything for us or divulge any secrets, but is there a specific reason for that? It's just the, it's part of the master's dress, you know, the master's outfit. He wears a hat, a covering. He's the only one in the lodge that does, unless you're required to have your head covered by your religion. I don't know that there's any specific reason for, or symbolism behind a top hat, aside from it's just the traditional formal headwear in our society i'm trying to remember like pictures in the in the 1800s like what does the master wear you know before top hats were popular i'd have to go look i don't know yeah it's a good question thanks (laughs) no no problem (laughs) it's a it's a nice little homework assignment i'm absolutely (laughs) yeah gonna look it up (laughs) so going back to the art of memory you know Mm -hmm. I, i mentioned this before uh or i think i mentioned it where you know i was first introduced to this when reading about Giordano Bruno and his mm-hmm. work. And this is somebody who has come up very, very casually in conversation on my podcast. I haven't really been able to do a, a deep dive into to Bruno and who he was and why his work is so important in these fields. And we don't have to do that now, but I am curious, you know, if you want to give some background on him, that's fine. But I really would like for you to flesh out, you know, what his approach to the art of memory was and how it was different than what came before him. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I'm a huge Giordano Bruno fan. Like, if he had a fan club today, I would absolutely be part of it. <laughs> I love Giordano Bruno. Okay, so he was a Dominican monk who lived in the 16th century. He was burned at the stake in the year 1600 for heresy. He was really like a savant when it came to memory. So his approach to the art of memory uh, has a lot of depth and and breadth to it. You know, he had he had systems for creating locations and systems for creating images that are so complicated that they take like books and books and books. Like he's a very complicated thinker. But essentially, like his approach to uh, the power of images, like, uh, you know, I I earlier used the term um, that that real things are like the shadows of forms, uh, which is kind of directly from Bruno. You know, he has this book, De Umbris Idearum, on the shadows of ideas, that talks about images in the mind being shadows of uh, more pure ideas, like a very like straight Renaissance Neoplatonic magical view of like images in the mind being you know, reflections of forms and, you know, pretty much the stuff that I was already describing. I think I kind of stole most of that from Bruno uh, and probably put my own spin on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there's this dude, Scott Gosnell, who um, has translated a good number of Bruno's works on the art of memory. And they're definitely worth checking out. His one book, one of his books is called 30 Seals and the Seal of Seals. And the 30 seals are all different memory palace designs that he's created. So in Bruno, Bruno become, had become so adept at, at, the memor- at the memory palace system, at the method of loci, that he was just sort of creating new loci whole cloth out of imagination, right? He didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't use existing buildings or existing structures or anything. He just created new uh, locations just straight in his memory and then populated them that way. Now, that's pretty impressive, and it's it's harder to do, and a lot of um, classical texts tell you to use a real building, not an imaginary building, or use real things, not imaginary things for that part. Bruno is of the opposite opinion. He's like, no, take, you know, create this structure in your mind and do this and this and this. And some of it works. You know, he's got an example in De Imbris Idearum, which is a poem that teaches you the Zodiac. And I spent like 10 minutes with it. 
and memorize the Zodiac in order, which is something that as an occultist, I probably should have done a long, long time ago. Uh, but I never paid that much attention to it. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God, I have I have it in order now. It's just this one poem. You just imagine the poem and you make like cartoon characters out of every uh, zodiacal symbol in, in the poem and what they're doing to each other. Suddenly, it, it all works. The images just stick in your head. So he really had like all these different methods of memorization that involved using the imagination almost entirely. And I guess there's a little bit of there's a little bit of disagreement on whether Bruno believed his memory stuff to actually be magic or not. He may have just couched it in those terms because people wouldn't believe that he had a memory that good. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really amazing how quickly the art of memory died out after the printing press came in, because, you know, we're talking like a hundred and. 170 years after the printing press is when Bruno was executed. And by that time, the art of memory was only taught pretty much in uh, Catholic monasteries to like weird monks that lived up in the mountains. Nobody else learned it. That's the kind of life I want, though. I want to be the weird monk that lives in the mountains that gets taught the art of memory. You know what? I want to be a weird monk on a mountain learning the art of memory also. Maybe we should get... Can we start a Kickstarter for this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Or well, totally... no, because no, because Kickstarter, like Kickstarter, you have to give people rewards. So maybe oh. just like a maybe just like a straight GoFundMe where it's just like you donate because you believe in the cause so much you don't need anything in return for oh. it. Oh, or maybe uh, some sort of like uh, monastic Patreon. Yes, <laughs> we'll we'll call it uh, we'll call it Matreon. Matri- the, the okay. <laughs> well, Matreon is the mother of all crowdfunding websites oh there you go it automatically spreads your campaign across every single crowdfunding website and collect yeah there you go it, 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 you get the widest uh, audience that way we should probably call a patent attorney that was a good idea yeah it was it was actually back to your point well, go ahead go ahead okay okay no actually i was gonna say like back to your monastery thing like the monastery thing that you brought up a couple of times something that our society really lacks right now is some sort of monastic tradition like it used to be that monasteries, like they would kind of support themselves. You know, they'd sort of you'd live out in the woods and you'd farm or brew beer or something like that and sell it to a village in order to support yourself. But we don't really have like a good monastery thing going on in the United States. I would love it if we had monasteries. I would totally go be a monk. Let me tell you how dire the monastery situation is here, at least around where I live. So uh-huh. my parents live about three hours north of me. So whenever I I go up to visit them, I drive by on the outskirts of like a of a little lake town is an old monastery. It is huge, it is beautiful. It is one of the mm-hmm. the greatest and most beautiful structures that I think you could find in the state of Ohio. Mm-hmm. It's a senior living community now. Ah! And that I think just encapsulates <laughs> What you are talking about. <laughs> the lack oh. of monastery system here in the States is pathetic. Like I said, it's it's in dire straits, but it's a gorgeous structure. If I can find a photo of it, I'll put it in the show notes. But it is right. just like, it is, it's so beautiful. And every time I drive by there, I'm just like, it has, a, it has a nice long driveway lined with trees like leading up to it. And I'm just like, I've never driven up there, but I, I've always wanted to. But since I've been driving on my own to go up my parents' way since I moved out, always been a senior living community and i it's just it's so sad to me because it's such a gorgeous building and you have just a bunch of geriatrics dying in there like essentially oh, and it, it, it's just it's that's such a sad. waste to me yeah it's very sad that reminds me of something that's totally unconnected to anything we've talked about except that there's the cool building idea thing um very close to me in portland there's a uh, a fairly large complex that's between like 36th and 39th on on Powell for anybody who's in Portland listening to this. And I've discovered through Google Maps and Pokemon Go that they have like... (laughs) I play Pokemon Go. I like Pokemon Go. Uh, That they have a a labyrinth on their property. And it looks really well maintained. I'm trying to figure out if people are allowed to like go in and visit. Yeah, that'd be cool. But I think it's like a I think it's a senior living center or some sort of like nursing home of some sort. So I'm not really sure. I was gonna I was gonna try to do it today, but I had to come back here instead for a I podcast. Would, well, shit, man. You could have easily said, Hey, I'm gonna go walk through a labyrinth instead of talk to you. I totally understand. <laughs> well, oh I'll, I'll do it I'll I'll report back. You know, I'm I'm gonna maybe go, maybe go check it out later. I do hope though, for your sake, it is not a uh, a shining esque labyrinth. With the Jack Torrance running through it. Yeah, or the um, in the book, I think they had like uh, hedge animals that came to life and like tried to eat yeah. in the labyrinth or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll 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 bring some uh, shears just in case. 
<laughs> yeah, and maybe a couple beers too, it's yeah. just to liven things up. Right. So to tie up the art of memory conversation, have we touched on the most pertinent facts and oh. information here, or is there more to flesh out, you think? I think there is more to flesh out. I think that uh, one really important thing is that um, the art of memory, uh, if we practice it, so so currently the art of memory is used by memory champions, right? Like memory, there's like these competitive memory events where people go and, you know, memorize digits of pi or memorize the order of a shuffled pack of cards or memorize blah, you know, they, they compete to be able to memorize tons and tons of stuff. I really, I'm not interested in that, right? Like I use the art of memory, but I don't pursue it to such an extent that I'm like some sort of memory competitor. You can't you can't just rattle off a list of things to me and I, I'm not going to memorize them that quickly. For me, the art of memory is very much like a contemplative practice. So I kind of use it while I'm meditating. I use it a lot when I uh, read tarot, for instance. Like I have memory structures that not only store tarot card meanings, but also um, memory structures using different tarot decks that, that aid me during you know, tarot reading. And then I also use the art of memory for ritual. So when I do magical ritual, I memorize things using the art of memory in a in a memory structure that sort of aligns itself with the ritual. So for instance, you could use, you know, like lots of ritual uses like magic circles or lots of, you know, there's lots of different like magical symbols or magical alphabets or all sorts of things. So you create a memory structure in your mind that is that is basically the the imaginal area in which you will be performing the ritual. You could call it like an astral temple, for instance. It's, that's a technique that is that is really akin to this. And then you use that asp- that that imaginal space to encode the ritual. So you, so I in my in my opinion, ritual performed from memory is far more powerful than ritual performed by reading it off a sheet of paper. Primarily because you encode the symbols of the ritual in your psyche at, uh, as you use the art of memory to record it. So I would encourage people, magicians, meditators, tarotists, to learn a little bit about the art of memory and try to use the technique during their ritual and during their their daily practice. So is this something also that uh, I could incorporate into a yoga practice? Yes, yes. In fact, one of the things that, that we learned from like Lynn Kelly's book, The Memory Code, is that things in the physical world, physical things correspond to spiritual things, right? So you can use, uh, you can actually use like the forms that you create or the shapes that you create as you're bending yourself around in yoga to encode memories or record memories. You can also use, um, like if you do any sort of like chakra meditation, a lot of that is very visual. So you can, you can practice the, at least visualization techniques. I think visualization and, and active imagination, you know, the, the, the exercising of the phantasmic apparatus, phantasmal apparatus, whatever the heck I called it before. Um, I think that's also really important to like learning how to really vividly use your imagination and your power of visualization will like shoot every ritual you do to the moon easily or past it. You know, there's tons of tons of planets out there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, how could we incorporate this into, you know, maybe just more mundane, everyday, non-magical things that we do? Can Um, I incorporate this into like like a writing practice? Can I incorporate this into a weightlifting practice? Can I, I mean, like what does this apply <laughs> to, to, to anything besides these, you know, these meditative and magical yogic rituals or, I mean, is it? Yeah, absolutely. So it was classically considered part of rhetoric. You know, uh, the art of memory was the ability uh, uh, contributed to the development and art of rhetoric. So if you had like an argument or a talk or something that you're going to give, you would use the art of memory to record your points in order and so that you'd be able to rattle them off later on. But uh, I think you can use it anytime there's a sequence of things that need to be remembered. Uh, some people use it for, you could use it for like phone numbers. There are different memory techniques for that. You can use it for grocery shopping if you feel like it. That's not very exciting, but yeah, you can totally <laughs> use it for, well, I mean, weightlifting. So we, a lot of us, we, we memorize stuff by rote, right? So like if you're doing like a weightlifting routine, Maybe you have a specific order that you have to do things in and a specific number of reps and sets, you know, for each mm-hmm. item. And you can, if it's long, you can encode that in Art of Memory. I don't know that, I have no idea how long a usual weightlifting routine is, but, you know. Uh. In fact, if you went to the same gym every day, you could, and you had like, you could absolutely record using the Art of Memory images in each machine as you go along. Like, oh, I'm at this machine. I'm supposed to do, you know, there's like a, 
carrot driving a race car, which which reminds me that I'm supposed to do like five reps of 15 pounds in sets of three or something like that, you know. Um, right. So so yeah, you could absolutely use it for all sorts of things. A lot of times this involves you know sort of creating like your own memory alphabet for images. It's like creating images quickly. That's that's the that's the hard part. Oh crap! No, that's not that. So there's an initial investment of creating the memory space. But if it's a physical space, you're actually walking around. It's a lot easier. Okay. There's some really good videos on YouTube about this, about creating a memory space where there's a memory champion who walks you through his apartment. And he's like, this is how we create the memory space. And then he shows you how to use it in images. It's pretty cool. Cool. So yeah, why don't we just wrap up here? Is there anything else about the art of memory that you want to throw out there before we do that? No, I think I've given everybody tons of stuff to think about. And I just want people to practice it. Amen. I cannot agree with you more. I have not done any of the memory palace or visualization practices, but I have in my own life just tried to use my own memory and imagination to recall things. When we get into a conversation here and and we get stuck on like something that we could easily look up on the internet, I don't want to do that anymore. Like I've tried to stop doing that. So if I don't know it, I don't know it. If I don't remember it, I don't remember it. Yeah. And that's, that's totally, that's, uh, definitely something you should be able to do. And, uh, you know, I mean, for for interviewing people, it's great to have images or, or things like that that help you remember specific topics. Like you could just create a chain of, of things like that Zodiac poem I was talking about earlier and just have like a whole chain of ideas that you keep in your head. Like, oh, I have to make sure I bring this up. I really want to bring this up. And then you can like skip over a few. And yeah, that's cool. That's, that's a good way to do it. Well, like for yeah. example, just to, to end this on a a visualization sort of so i remember you know you had sent me a link to a lecture that you that you did on this topic and Uh i downloaded it uh, to my phone actually and i was walking through a local farmer's market and i was listening to it and i remember like the name uh I, i don't know how to pronounce it but the guy that we mentioned earlier was it julio camillo right yeah julio camillo i think that's how you pronounce it and i don't recall ever hearing his name before and I was uh-huh. just listening to you talk about him, and I was walking by Squash. So now, when I was huh? talking about him earlier, I got the image of the Squash in my mind, and then I associated that with his name. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's that's related. I mean, you know, any sort of image that you use that's tied to another memory is totally like that. I Yeah, I mean, I can think of examples like that, too. We should, um, since we're so close, we should totally wrap up. I should be like... My name is Eric Arneson. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so Eric, this has been a really cool chat. Do tell the people where they can find your work and keep up with you. All right. People, you can find me on Twitter as Arnemancy, A-R-N-E-M-A-N-C-Y. I have a podcast called My Alchemical Bromance where we discuss beer and the occult. and We interview a lot of folks. And I also have a website, arnamancy.com, where I write about hermeticism and the art of memory and tarot and other stuff. So I, hopefully you can check some of that out. And also, I think you should listen to uh, more episodes of a culture podcast. And then you should go rate them on iTunes. Give them five stars. Tell the world that this podcast is super groovy. Hey, you just made my job a hell of a lot easier, man. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> to mutually kiss each other's asses. I am a huge fan of your podcast because I do like the very laid back, loose, conversational nature of it. And it's impressive because it's guys that are obviously well-versed in the occult and the esoteric topics where you can just sit down over beer or whiskey sometimes and just shoot the shit about this stuff without having to really prepare, which is something that I am really envious of. I have to read and listen to things and like prepare for these conversations because I don't have the foundational knowledge yet to be able to keep up with guys like you. So I'm really impressed with you and your body of work and couldn't be more excited to have you here, man. Well, thanks. Thanks. I I mean, don't sell yourself short. I've been listening to your podcast and you do a great job. Doesn't even seem like you're preparing. It just seems like you know the stuff and you're interviewing people super easily. I'm I'm impressed. So wait, we should let's just stop like scratching each other's backs here. That's getting a little embarrassing. Okay. Yeah. So so Eric Arneson, (laughs) Arnamancy.com, Arnamancy on Twitter, My Alchemical Bromance, wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for being here, man. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that was quite the alchemical bromance, if I may say so. Be sure to check out Eric's work in the show notes and do what you can to support the show. As he said, share it with friends, rate and review on iTunes, hit up our support link in the show notes to donate monetarily. Five stars, five dollars, it all helps. 
And let me tell you why exactly your support matters. I host this podcast through a service called Libsyn. It's a pretty popular podcast hosting service. I know several other podcasters, uh, former guests who host there. Their customer service is great, but there's been a a rather head-scratching change in the stats that they provide, the data that they provide to those of us who use their service. I've heard and seen a a lot of other podcasters say their audience numbers have dropped by 60 to 70% since Libsyn changed this data reporting over the course of the last couple of months. And this podcast is no different. The downloads are way down. Now, that might not be unusual, you know, there are ebbs and flows to these sorts of things. But at the same time, subscribers to the podcast are increasing. So for downloads to be down, but subscribers to be up, that's where the head-scratching part comes in. It doesn't make much sense. Now, the other podcasters who I've heard or seen talk about this issue are also podcasting in this fringe sort of area, the occult conspiracy theories, UFOs, etc. So I'm wondering if because of that uh, particular genre, if maybe our numbers aren't being suppressed or changed altogether. That's already happening on YouTube, and it wouldn't surprise me if it was happening elsewhere as well. The only reason this sounds even remotely plausible to me is because if you hit a certain number of downloads per month with Libsyn, you're eligible to participate in their advertising program. And I was at that threshold when they announced these stat changes, and then my number of downloads per episode and thus per month, they didn't just go down, they went down quite a bit. But again, subscribers kept increasing, curiouser and curiouser. Now, not that I would participate in their advertising program, I wouldn't because I'm not a fan of reading ads. But I can't help but wonder if this isn't a case of preventing people in these fringe areas of podcasting from making money through advertising. And my YouTube videos, for example, have already been demonetized for the same reason. So I don't think it's out of the question that Libsyn may be up to something similar. And I don't want to point fingers or accuse anyone there of anything. But this whole thing, again, is quite curious. And this is why it's important to support the independent podcasters that you enjoy. And not just me. There's plenty of people out there doing great work in this medium and in this genre who deserve the support. Guys like Eric here, he does a great job both on his blog and his podcast. He's a great resource. And, you know, we can't all be Joe Rogan or Duncan Trussell or even Sam Tripoli. Most of us don't come in here with name value. Some of us just want to live that new American dream that John Michael Greer and I were talking about in our last episode. Some of us just want a little something to call our own, and I don't think that's too much to ask. But anyway, that's enough of me on my soapbox. I gotta get out of here. Until next time, you've been listening to O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.